you to celebrate it with me because I just love being here with you all. And I want to thank you for <laughs> Um, I want to bring your attention to the brochure you have about our fall bazaar on November the 11th. Um, there will be a lot of arts and crafts and door prizes. But if you happen to have any really nice stuff that you were gifted and would like to re-gift, those might great door prizes. <laughs> I'm done. Anyhow, so... Let us stand and sing. Oh, we've got three great songs today. What a friend you have in Jesus. We thank you, Father, that no matter how deep and wide our sins of the past, that you are a God who offers us your mercy and your forgiveness, and we may come before you and have an audience with you. We thank you for your promise through Jesus that 
if we would make the decision to follow in your way, that through that walk with you, that you would change who we are. And as you change who we are, and you give us an audience with you, through your holy word and through our prayers, we may move from a life of sin into a life of righteousness. We may move from being children of this world to become children of God. And so we come to worship you with our songs. We, we worship you with our prayers that uh, we speak aloud and that we uh, come to you in silence. And we thank you that not only do you hear our prayers, but you answer our prayers. And, and when we ask in foolishness, you give us answers in wisdom. And sometimes that answer is not yet. You're not ready to receive. And sometimes that answer is uh, not in the way you think, but in a much better way. And so we thank you, Lord, that you, as our Heavenly Father, that you look out for our well-being. We ask that as we worship you, that, that you would pour out your Spirit upon us, and that you would renew us in, in our hopes and in our uh, you will correct our desires. You will ease our fears and you will give us a confidence that goes beyond a peace that the world can give. Equip us today for, to, for the rest of this week and for the months to come. Help us to grow in your word and write it upon our hearts and minds so that we may speak it. <coughs> to those who would hear. Help us in this time of, of violence and hatred to be able to be uh, sons and daughters of God who will pray for our enemies and ask your blessing upon those who curse us. Father, I do ask that you give us protection from the evil in this world. Though I recognize that as, as a nation, as a people, we don't really deserve it. We've turned from you in a lot of ways. But Father, we ask that you would use us to speak your truth in love. That others may hear your truth and hopefully see your light. Help us to pray for those that, that would even harm us. Help, to, help us to have a compassion for those who have not deserved compassion because we didn't deserve compassion and you offer it to us anyway. We ask these things in that powerful name of Jesus Christ. And Father, I, I direct our thoughts to that prayer that you taught us to pray. When you said, when you pray, pray like this. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. May your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. first scripture this morning comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 49, verse 1, and then it'll go to 22 to 26. If you remember, Jacob was Abraham's grandson. So this is about Jacob. Then Jacob called for his sons and said, gather around so that I can tell you what will happen to you in the days to come. Joseph is a fruitful vine. A fruitful vine near a spring, his branches climb over a wall. With, bitter, with bitterness, archers attacked him. They shot at him with hostility, but his bow remained steady. His strong arms stayed limber because of the hand of the mighty one of Jacob, because of the shepherd, 
the rock of Israel. This is still open. Sorry. Because of your father's God, father's God, who helps you, because of the Almighty who blesses you with blessings of the skies above, blessings of the deep springs below, blessings of the breast and womb, your father's blessings are greater than the blessings of the ancient mountains, than the bounty of the old age old hills. Let all these rest on the head of Joseph, on the brow of the prince among his brothers. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Um, and now, if you will turn in your bulletin, we'll recite the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. While we receive the offering, the ushers will also be receiving uh, any prayer requests that you have written down. Uh, please hand it to them separately so that uh, they'll be able to keep it separate and hand that to me. And while we're doing that, let us stand and sing Victory in Jesus.
scripture comes from numbers. So they were counting everybody. Which I didn't realize was important. But you know what? After the exile, they had to figure out who came from which family. So counting everybody was really important so they knew what house they came from. Of course you didn't know that. <laughs> okay, numbers 24, 1 through 9. Now when Balaam saw that it would please the Lord to bless Israel, he did not resort to divination as at other times, but turned his face toward the wilderness. When Balaam looked out and saw Israel encamped tribe by tribe, the Spirit of God came on him. And he spoke this message. The prophecy of Balaam, son of Baal. The prophecy of one whose eye sees clearly. The prophecy of one who hears the words of God. Who sees a vision from the Almighty. Who falls prostrate and whose eyes are opened. How beautiful are your tents, Jacob. Your dwelling places, Israel. Like valleys, they spread out like gardens beside a river, like aloes planted by the Lord, like cedars beside the waters. Water will flow from their buckets. Their seed will have abundant water. Their king will be greater than Agog. Their kingdom will be exalted. God brought them out of Egypt. They have the strength of a wild ox. They devour hostile nations and break their bones in pieces. With their arrows, they pierce them. Like a lion, they crouch and lie down like a lioness. Who dares to rouse them? May those who bless you be blessed, and those who curse you be cursed. Words of God to the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Father in Heaven, we turn our hearts to you today. After a, a week of mourning the, the lives of so many who were killed in that Saturday attack on various civilian communities in Israel. And we continue to mourn others who have died. We mourn civilians that are caught in the crossfire in the defensive attack against the, the city of Gaza as rockets continue to fly from Gaza, as ground troops continue to go out from Gaza. And as Israel responded with bombing, with rockets and with cannons, with drones, those, those places that the rocket fire was coming out of the city of Gaza, At first, Father, I didn't take the time to look and see what was going on. I thought it was going to be the same old, same old. Flaring up again. But then I decided to go and watch the recorded news programs that were taking place. and It broke my heart to hear the accounts of not only homes that were stormed and the families killed, but whole villages where every single person in the village was killed. To hear of atrocities that took place. And the response of military force into Gaza is an understandable response in, in defending the nation's people. And yet it breaks our hearts to know of those families 
children, women, young and old men who are killed in the crossfire. And Father, as I've heard of the numbers of Hamas terrorists that were killed in, and those that were uh, rounded up as uh, prisoners of war, I suppose, my heart hurts for those even who were the terrorists that did these despicable things. You've called us to pray for our enemies. I would not want to pray for someone who did such terrible things. I would not want to pray for their leaders who sent them out to do so. But my heart breaks for them. Lord Jesus, you died for every single person. Your torturous death upon the cross was to pay for the price of our sins. Your suffering and death makes possible our restoration of our souls and of our relationship with you as a Heavenly Father. And it is your desire that none should be lost, but so many are. Because they choose not the way of the truth of your word, but they choose the way of the sinful, broken world. I ask, Father, that as we worship you today, you would turn our hearts to sympathy and our rage to compassion. And I do understand that there's a time when evil people who do evil deeds must suffer the consequences. But Lord, help us to pray for their souls before they die, because once they're dead, it's done. But help us to pray, Lord, and help us to, to try to bless our enemies and bless those who curse us. I ask that you would guide the Israeli defense troops and that you would help them to use the electronics that they try to use to see where there are defenseless citizens in the line of fire and to do all that they can to avoid that. My heart goes out to the Israeli soldiers that are fighting to bring safety to their land again and will see the atrocities that their battle will do and Lord what it does to their hearts and minds. Protect them from rage. Protect them from hatred. As they do something that they must do to defend their people. We know that when there's war, the aftermath is war is, from war is also the broken hearts of those who wanted peace but brought about killing and destruction. And Father, in the midst of this, we continue to pray for our loved ones, our families, our brothers and sisters in faith. And so together with uh, Marissa, we lift up a prayer for a friend, John, who has an infection from follow-up of a kidney stone surgery. And Father, we ask that you would help his body to fight off and help whatever medicines that can be provided to 
empower him to overcome that, that infection. And we join with Linda Buffa in prayer for a friend, Jim, who's been diagnosed with cirrhosis of the liver and had to postpone a gallbladder surgery because of that. We also lift up his daughter, or granddaughter, Emery, a newborn just three weeks ago that was uh, premature by several weeks. We thank you, Lord, for that little baby that is, uh, has been healthy. We thank you, Father, for continuing to keep Charlotte Lee in our love and in the love of her family during this time. We ask for comfort for her. While we have such uncertainty of, is she going to get better? And we ask your comfort for her family. We continue to ask you, Lord, to deliver her from that and to give her her strength back and renew her health. With Sheila, we pray for her son-in-law, Dexter. Look for when he goes into surgery tomorrow. We ask that you protect him during the surgery, that you guide the doctors, and that you uh, allow the surgery to help him to come back to good health. And with Alice, we pray for Lynn's brother Jack, who's been diagnosed with cancer. Lord, as he goes into the chemo treatment and the radiation treatments, we ask that you, that you add your care and treatment to him, that the, the work of the doctors will have good results. And regardless of what uh, that can bring, Lord, we ask that you make up the difference on everything else, whether for his body or for his spirit. Father, we know that we all need to make sure that we're prepared to leave this life and go through death into eternity all the time, because we never know when the end of time will come for us. And help us to pre prepare our hearts and minds as we follow in your way. And we seek to have you replace a hardened heart with a pliable heart heart that follows you. In all these things, Lord, we cry out to you. For we know that it's the problems are not going to be solved by man. But eventually it will all be made right by you. We pray these things with expectation in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.
thank you for all who have come today to praise you and worship you and hear your word. We lift up our pastor that he might bring us your words that you have put upon his heart to speak to us, to draw us closer to you, to enrich our lives, that we might be the light of the world. Lay your hand upon him and hold him, Lord. Speak through him. And we also thank you for Valerie, who supports this man and his wondrous work. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 <clears throat> Two weeks ago, I finally decided I'm not going to keep wearing my robe and just sweltering underneath the robe. I'm going to wait till it gets cool again. And the very next Sunday, it was a little bit cooler. Today, I think even a little bit more cool. And so I almost, I, I brought my robe and I almost put it on and I thought, but then, now that it feels good, I'm going to swelter under my robe, so I'm not going to wear it yet. When it gets cold, I'll be glad to have the extra warmth. And, uh, but I put on the stole not to be fancy, because I know it doesn't make me look fancy, but just to be the reminder that it's not my word that I am to share with you. It is God's word that I am to share with you. And may the Holy Spirit give you wisdom so that as you take the knowledge that we can find in the Word of God, that God will give you wisdom to understand and to appropriately apply to your own life. Because only God knows your heart, but you can ask Him to show your heart to you. In the first reading there in Genesis, um, I jumped from verse 1 to verse 22 because there were uh, several prophetic words that God gave through Jacob to each of his sons, starting with Reuben and going on down the line. Um, it's worth reading. When you get home, turn to that passage in Genesis and, and read the whole thing. It's intriguing, it's good foundation for later things that you'll read uh, for understanding. But I wanted to focus specifically on this word uh, about, J about Joseph. Joseph is a fruitful vine, a fruitful vine near a spring whose branches climb over a wall. Now that's a nice image, isn't it? And uh, that's it. There. Now I won't have too many things. So that gave you a, an opportunity to dwell a little bit on that image of this fruitful vine going over the wall and, and just bearing a lot of fruit. Healthy, green, strong, and spreading. And then the next thing is a bit surprising. Verse 23, with bitterness archers attack him. They shoot at him with hostility. Remember when we were children... How often did you hear, Mom, that's not fair. <laughs> you remember that? How many times did you say it? Okay, don't raise your hand. You don't have to, have to confess. But how many times did we say, Mom, that's not fair? Plenty of times. And there's a lot of things that are not fair. But one of the things that my mom would respond so often is, this time it's your sister's turn. Next time it'll be your other sister's turn. And then it'll be your turn. And then it'll be Bill's turn. So there are times that one of us would have something special. Now so often my mom would always get the same thing for me and for my brother. And he, she would do the same thing for my sisters. So that it would appear that 
uh, everything's fair and even. But mom, let us experience the fact it's not always going to be fair. Sometimes it's going to be based on whether you've been good or not. She was a special ed teacher, uh, the first one in Flagler County. And uh, then later years, uh, that we moved to Ormond, and she was a special ed teacher there. And I remember as I was through, went through elementary school and junior high school, hearing uh, the details about things that my mom did with her students. And one of the things that she did was she let them know that if they could move from uh, where they were in their behavior problems to where they needed to be in their behavior problems by a certain date and have consistently been able to do well, then they would get to go on a field trip that Mrs. Reynolds was going to pay for. Now, she didn't make a big deal about that she paid for it. She just let them know, we'll have a field trip for the students that are able to improve their behavior to this level. And some of the students would get to go on the field trip to Disney World. And my mom paid for them to go. Now, she didn't have a class of 30 students. She had two classes of about 10 students, the ones that needed the most help to go from first grade through third grade, and the ones that needed uh, the most help to go from uh, fourth grade through sixth grade. And the younger class was in the morning, the older class was in the afternoon. The, uh, the half a day that they were not in her class, if their behavior was good enough, they could go to a regular, their regular classroom, but they would have uh, work assignments that she provided. So that if it's a third grade classroom and they were at first grade level work, they would pull out their math assignment, or whatever assignments that it would be. But when it came time to go to Disney World, there were students, uh, oh, and if they couldn't behave in a regular classroom, then they went home for half a day with the assignments that Mrs. Reynolds would give. So when it was time to go to Disney World, for those that were behaving well, they already understood it's not a matter of what's fair, it's a matter of what you've earned. There were students that would come up to her that weren't her students and say, Miss Reynolds, what do we need to do to be able to be in your class? <laughs> so there's rewards. And there's punishment. And God is a just God who provides rewards and punishment. Now this thing of Joseph being a fruitful vine that's near a spring whose branches climb over the wall and, okay, and then you go from that straight to with bitterness archers attacked him and they shot at him with hostility. See that's the it's not fair attitude. After World War II, when the, the nations that won the war recognized there were so many Jews in Europe that had nowhere to live. And it was still very hostile to them where they used to live. And eventually the, uh, the nations figured it out and decided this small part of what used to be Israel will be set aside to be for Jews that needed a place to live. I kind of think that God arranged that, that God touched people's hearts and had a part in that. It's not that they deserved it, but they needed it. And God provided. But if not God, then the kindness of those who were the victors provided it. Now, all around there, there's nations that are available for people who are Arabic descent. Uh, and they are pretty much specifically Muslim. One of the things that intrigues me is that, except for times like this past Saturday, and uh, a few more excursions after Saturday that went out from other places, and rockets that continue to be shot out of Gaza and some that have been shot out of Jordan. 
Uh, Israel, most of the time, is a safer place to be than any of those other countries around Israel. Even if you're Muslim. Because if you're Muslim and it's the wrong sect of Muslim and you don't, well, then you're not safe. I met a young man when I was blessed to go to Israel some years ago in Tel Aviv on the first morning we were there. And uh, he was our, my server at breakfast. And we had some conversation. We hit it off. He saw the t-shirt I was wearing that had a, cro a heart that was broken, but a cross that was mending. And there was a saying on there about heartbreak. But anyway, he, he, oh, you're a Christian, you're a Christian. He had the blackest skin I've ever seen. Dark, dark, dark black. You're a Christian, you're a Christian. And he wanted to talk with me. And he's talking with me. And uh, we visited. And after that morning, I thought, I want to give him this T-shirt. So I hand-washed it and uh, let it dry. And, but we left the next day and we went around. We were there for a, a little over a week. And we got back to Tel Aviv before we went home. And I just I said, Lord, I had the shirt washed, smelled good, folded. And I took it to breakfast with me. And I said, Lord, please let me see this young man. And I gave, I gave him the shirt. He, he told me about that he was Muslim and he became, he met Jesus. I met Jesus and I followed Jesus. But I had to leave my country and my family because they, they're supposed to kill me. And I came to Israel. So this Muslim young man who's become a Christian, where does he go to be safe? He went to Israel. And in Israel, you can be Christian, you can be Muslim, you can be Jew, you can be atheist, and you can live at peace, you can have a business, you can make a life for yourself. And it's an oasis of safety and acceptance until it isn't. So I love verses 24 to 25. When Joseph is attacked, this is a prophecy, by the way. The father is giving a prophecy about what's going to happen, not only in the personal life, but in, in the, uh, to, with the descendants of what they're going to be like. And, uh, but his bow remained steady, and his strong arm stayed limber because of the head, no, because of the hand of the mighty one of Jacob because of the shepherd, the rock of Israel, because of your father's God who helps you, because of the Almighty who blesses you with the blessings of the skies above, blessings of the deep springs below, blessings of the breast and womb. Your father's blessings are greater than the blessings of the ancient mountains, than the bounty of the age-old hills. Let all these rest on the head of Joseph on the brow of the prince among his brothers. I think that gives us a glimpse as we think about what, it is, what is it about Israel that there are those who hate them so much. And yet, um, Palestinians in the part that's not the city of Gaza have more freedom and more blessing than they do in other countries. In fact, the other countries don't want them. Egypt didn't want to open their doors. And other countries didn't want them. And the Israelites knew, the Jews knew what it was like to not be wanted. And they could have safe haven there. When I visited in, in Egypt, I think I may have told you once before, but it's worth saying again, our guide's mother was Jewish. That means legally he was Jewish. His father was Arabic. And so legally, he's Arabic. The, the two different uh, cultures, it's based on who your mother is for Jews. It's based on who your father is for Arabs. And his Arabic father became a Christian. And so the guy had context in every part of the community, not only in Jerusalem, but in Bethlehem, uh, 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 in, in Israel, Israeli uh, controlled and protected land, and in Palestinian controlled and protected land on 
the West Bank. We went to restaurants that were Palestinian restaurants and those that were Jewish restaurants. We went to shops that were Christian shops and Jewish shops and uh, Arabic shops. And uh, one of the things that I learned while I was there was that most people in Israel want peace. They just want to get up and go to work and earn money for the day, for the family. Whatever kind of work they do, they want to just live in peace with the other people of different faiths. But it's outsiders that bring in the hatred and the uh, terrorism. So yes, it is appropriate to say we, we, we need to pray for and have compassion for the Palestinians that live in Gaza underneath the control of others. Even though they may have elected the wrong leaders. We've had times when we in our nation elected wrong leaders. Yes. Okay. And it doesn't matter which way we lean, we all believe that some of our leaders have been the wrong ones, don't we? Right. Okay. And clearly a lot of our leaders have led us into patterns in our culture, in our, in our land, that are very contrary to what God calls us to. So we need to pray for those on both sides of this fight. And uh, both the civilians and the soldiers for what war requires them to do. So in Numbers, verse 2, when Balaam looked out and saw Israel in camp tribe by tribe, the Spirit of God came on him. The Spirit of God came on him. God intervened. All right? The prophecy of Balaam, son of Beor, the prophecy of one whose eye sees clearly, the prophecy of one who hears the words of God, who sees a vision from the Almighty, who falls prostrate, and whose eyes are opened. Now that's a pretty strong proclamation in it. It's intriguing to me that um, Beor, I mean, um, Balaam, uh, it says, uh, it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, and he did not resort to divination as to at other times, but turned his face toward wilderness. Instead of going with uh, the, I'm going to say sort of witchcraft practices, uh, that apparently he was quite familiar with. He was called to conjure something up by the outside invading king uh, and, uh, and to call curses down on Israel. But he ended up telling the king, you know, I'm not, I can't make things happen to Israel. It's whatever happens is going to be from God. And then God gives him the, the vision and he goes to tell uh, the king, well, this is this is God's answer, but don't blame me. In verse 8, God brought them out of Egypt. Talking about the people of Israel. God brought them out of Egypt. They have the strength of a wild ox. They devour hostile nations and break their bones into pieces. They devour hostile nations. There were nations that were, when they came back, there were nations that remembered Abraham and his God. And some of those nations said, hey, all right, come on in. And God let the Israelites know that those people could be incorporated into you know, God's giving them the land, but they can be incorporated into the laws of God. They didn't all have to be killed. Now, we see that in time, the people of God uh, were kicked out of the land. First the northern tribes in it, of Israel and then the southern tribes of Israel. And the temple was even destroyed. Then God allowed the temple to be rebuilt. And that things were great for a while. But then the temple was destroyed again because the people turned from God. And so God's people are accountable to God's way and God's law. I know there are many 
religious devout Jews in Israel. There are also many who are much like the Christians in this country, so many of us, who are not very devout. We just sort of kind of believe, and we just sort of kind of try to do good things. And so they're not any better, and we're not any better than so much of the world in so many ways. It's important for us to recognize that. Now let's see what God calls us to. It's not part of the reading. But these are some scripture passages that I think the Lord led me to, to recognize what is our role today. Okay. In Psalm 82, verses 2 through 4, How long will you defend the unjust and show partiality to the wicked? Now we can think about in our culture, what are some of the ways that we continue to defend the unjust and show partiality to the wicked? Verse 3, defend the weak and the fatherless. Uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. This isn't just about this past week. And it's not just about what's going on in Israel, it's about us in our part of the world and how our nation has been living our lives. What we overlook because of convenience. All right, Luke chapter 6, verses 27 to 29. But you who are listening, to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. When I was listening to news last night of things that took place on Friday, uh, I record the news so I can uh, digest it a little bit at a time and then not for a while. But it was, it was real easy for me to think what should be done to those people that were praising the evil works of some terrorists. But it also allowed me to see how foolishly ignorant so many people are. And I, and I allowed God to turn my anger into concern and compassion. Where I just wish things would happen to... to Wipe them away, you know, arrest them all, uh, send them over to, to, to Palestine, uh, send them to the other Arabic country. You know, those kinds of thoughts. But he says, love your enemies. This is Jesus saying, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. I don't think it means send billions of dollars so that they can keep hurting other people. But I do believe that it means that we need to not let Satan turn our hearts into hard hearts. And we need to reach out with compassion and wherever we can. I was, I was encouraged to see that there was this young girl who grew up in the United States. She went and spent some time in Israel, decided to volunteer and, and do the two years of being a soldier that every young person in Israel, male and female, spends two years in the military, and then they're in the reserves. And she got the call, and she went back. And her job is flying drones, uh, flying drones and on, on the ground drones to go and peek with little cameras to see, are there civilians there before they blow it up? And she said that there's times that she says, ah, there's civilians there. So they don't blow it up. They wait till a better, more opportune time. Now that can't happen all the time, but at least they're trying to do that. And if they can have compassion, we certainly need to be able to have compassion for those that are caught up in this. Those who are believing the lies that they've been taught all their lives. Those who call us the big Satan. 
So what are we going to do with our hearts? If someone slaps you on your cheek, turn them the other cheek. If someone takes your coat, then do not hold your sh shirt from them or withhold your shirt from them. Yeah, that's the kind of way that Jesus wants us to respond. But he doesn't say if someone is about to kill your whole community, just let them kill you. It doesn't go that far. It doesn't go that far. And I say that because I've struggled for a long time not quite understanding what Jesus was saying. We rarely have these two paragraphs together. In Luke chapter 22, Luke chapter 22, verse 31 through 38, you'll remember this first part. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you, all of you, as, wait, I'm going to read again. Simon, <laughs> Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But Simon replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. But Jesus responded with this. I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. I think that he's saying to Peter, you going to prison and dying with me uh, is not my plan for you. You're not ready for that. You've got some things to go through. And I have a plan for you where you are to help the others not to fail and to stand strong. So Jesus doesn't call for all of us to die. He wants for a lot of us to live and speak the good news and tell people of the way of God. We're not all called to arms. In verse 35, then Jesus asked them, when I sent you without purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? Nothing, they answered. You remember what that was? When he sent out the 12, and then he sent out the 70 and the 72. Um, he said, don't take money with you. Don't take a bag that you put out for people to drop money in. Don't take extra sandals or an extra cloak. Just go with the bare minimum. And when you go from place to place, if there's somebody that wants to hear the good news, then stay with them. You see, you're not going to go prepared to take care of yourself. You're going to trust that the Lord's going to take care of you through these people that you share the good news with. Did you lack of anything? No, nothing. Now, this is the part that I struggle with. He said to them, but now if you have a purse, take it. And also a bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. What? If you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one things are going to get bad. But I think, why would he want them to have a sword? If we're following Jesus, if they come to arrest us, to torture us, to kill us, aren't we supposed to not defend ourselves? Or are we not supposed to defend our children, our wives, our neighbors? You know, that, that was a dilemma for me. And Jesus says, if you don't have a sword, then buy one. It is written, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. Okay, he's talking in these puzzles again. And I could just see myself as one of the disciples where I'm going, okay, I don't get what he's saying right now. But he said to get a sword. Okay, that's... And what do we see? The disciples resp responded instead of, wait a minute, what are you saying in this puzzle talk? They said, see, Lord, here are two swords. And Jesus said, that is enough. That will be enough. The best I can come up with is that there's a time for everything. And there's a time to defend if we go back to the psalm, the 80, 82nd psalm, 
verses 1 through 4, God presides in the great assembly. He renders judgment among the gods. How long will you defend the unjust and show partiality to the wicked? Verse 3, defend the weak and the fatherless. Uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. There apparently are times when force needs to be used. I don't know when. And I don't know when I might or might not take arms to defend my neighbors. I do know some preachers that I have a lot of respect for that when I was young and getting ready to go in ministry, the guy that was our Bunnell preacher wore cowboy boots. Okay, He'd have probably been pretty comfortable here. But he let me know, he said, every Sunday when I'm in the pulpit, my handgun is in the pulpit in front of me. Because if someone comes in to slaughter the sheep, I'm going to defend them. And as far as I know, he's never had to do that. But I can understand. And there is time when force must be used to stop the wicked. May God make it so. May He give us the wisdom that we need as individuals, as a community of faith, and as voters in this country. May He give wisdom to our politicians who are struggling to be wise. May God make it so. All right, let's sing that for us for our last song. and the wickedness that has taken place. That the flaming arrows from Satan are the ones that make me want to hate and be torn up in anger. The helmet of salvation protect our thoughts. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, the Word of God. And let me leave you with this. What's your sword like? Is it a little sword? You know, that little dagger from Frodo? You know, Lord of the Rings? Is it a little sword? Or do you have a lot of the Word of God? Is it a big sword? How about this? Is your sword, is it a two-edged sword? Is it sharp? 
Or is it one of those that you practice with that doesn't have any sharpness on it? How many times people have said, oh, I've read the Bible through five times. Or I've read the Bible through cover to cover seven times. Sometimes, often I want to say, but how, often, how many days a week do you read the Bible? How many days in a week? How many times? How much time do you spend in a week reading the Bible? Just not cover to cover, but just learning what God's Word says and, and praying over it so that you can write it upon your heart and mind so that you can use that sword of, of the Word of God. And the Word of God is truth. We've got to be prepared because we don't want to be casualties because we let hatred enter in. We don't want to be casualties because we're afraid and, and so we run and hide. We don't want to be casualties in all of this. We want to have a strong spiritual strength of the Lord working in us so that He can use us. And maybe more people will be saved from eternal destruction. May God make it so. Amen.